We will examine Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16, to determine whether or not it is about the doctrine of the Trinity or King Cyrus the Great, the ancient ruler of the Persian Empire. Welcome to the Biblical Bonitarian channel. My name is Mario. When I was a Trinitarian, I would regularly search the scriptures to look for verses that could be used as solid support for the doctrine of the Trinity. One verse that was recommended to me was Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. Now, this verse was impressive because it appeared to teach that there were three persons who were the Lord God making a Trinity. And even more impressive is that this verse was found in the Old Testament. In this video, we will examine Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16 in detail. Let's begin by reading this verse and then examining the specific claims that are made by those who use it to teach the Trinity. Draw near to me, hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret, and from the time it came to be, I have been there, and now... The Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Typically, the first claim that's made is that this verse sits in a wider context that begins in Isaiah 48, verse 12, where the Lord God is the speaker. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. And to this claim, we all agree. Secondly, it's claimed that in the next verse, verse 13, the Lord God is still the speaker. My hand laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they stand at attention. And to this claim, we also agree. Next, it's typically claimed that in verse 14, you have God providing the summons and statements to his people. And of this, we also agree. Next, in verse 15, it's pointed out that the Lord God is still the speaker. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him and he will prosper in his way. And also, with this claim, we agree. Then fifthly, what's argued is when you come to verse 16, that the Lord God is still the speaker. And we see this by the continued use of pronouns such as me and I. Draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning, I have not spoken in secret, from the time it came to be, I have been there, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Now from these claims, what's typically concluded is this, first, that the Lord God who is speaking and is sent is the Son. They would argue that the son is typically the one described in the New Testament as the one who would be sent by God and is sent by God. Secondly, the Lord God who is sending him is the father. And then thirdly, the spirit of the Lord is with the son. And therefore you have the son, the father, and the spirit. And this, they would argue, is the Trinity. Now, this is strengthened by them putting quotations around the entirety of verse 16 and all of its statements. Thus, what they are claiming is that one member of the Trinity is describing all three members. You have the Son who is speaking about the Lord God, who is his Father, and the Spirit of the Lord, which is with him, as the third member. So what is our response as Bonitarians? We'll begin by examining the life of King Cyrus of Persia, and we will provide seven solid facts that are relevant to this passage. First, Cyrus lived between 600 and 530 BC. Secondly, he was considered in his day and now as a true world leader. Cyrus ruled over what is called the Achaemenid Empire, which from Persia went as far west as the Balkans, far east as the Indus Valley in India, as far south as the Nile River in Africa, and earned him the title 
king of kings. And even in his day, he was called Cyrus the Great. Next, Cyrus was considered to be a formidable military strategist. Beginning in Persia, Cyrus expanded the Archimedean Empire in all directions through very strategic military success and conquest. Cyrus was so great that eventually he even conquered Babylon, which was considered one of the greatest empires of the ancient world. Now, amazingly, Cyrus did this without having a direct war with the Babylonians. He did it really through cunning and military strategy. Fourthly and surprisingly, Cyrus was also considered a great humanitarian then and now. Very often when Cyrus conquered a particular land, the people of that land would welcome him as a liberator. For example, for example, when Cyrus finally entered Babylon, the Babylonians openly welcomed Cyrus because they preferred him to their present leader, but they also viewed him as a humanitarian. In fact, even to this day, one of the great artifacts of the ancient world, the Cyrus Cylinder, is viewed as one of the first great charters on human rights. Cyrus opposed slavery, and he believed in the freedoms of the people whom he ruled. Fifthly, Silas, then and now, was widely regarded. For example, eventually the Greeks ended up taking over the Persian Empire many years after Cyrus had passed from the scene. However, when they took over the empire, they had no need to write favorably about Cyrus. However, in their writings of Herodotus, one of the great Greek historians, he wrote very highly about Cyrus and considered him a great example of what a world leader should be. Even today, throughout all the centuries, when we're asked who on the list of the greats was truly great, Cyrus is usually at the top of that list. Sixthly, Cyrus is widely regarded in biblical studies because of his policy of returning the Jews to their land after the Babylonian exile. Cyrus was a Zoroastrian, and he practiced a monotheistic faith that was not exactly like Judaism. Both within and outside of the Bible, Cyrus is regarded as the one who ended the Jewish Babylonian exile and returned a remnant of them back to Israel along with artifacts that had been taken from the temple by Nebuchadnezzar and allowed them to both rebuild the temple, but also to live within their land. And as such, the Jews highly regarded Cyrus and labeled him as an anointed Messiah. It is for this particular, it is in this particular role that Cyrus is focused upon in this section of Isaiah. Lastly, Cyrus is regarded as an anointed Gentile, even in the Old Testament, a title that is not applied to anyone except Jewish kings. He is even called by name in the pages of Isaiah, beginning in Isaiah chapter 45, 150 years before he even arrived on the scene. You can already see why this would make Cyrus to be considered one of the great leaders, not only outside of the Bible, but even within the Bible. With this background in mind, we'll now begin to look afresh at Isaiah 48, 16 and its surrounding context and ask the question, is this passage about the Trinity or King Cyrus? Let's recall that those who use this verse claim that one member of the Trinity is describing all three members in verse 16. We will respond by providing six solid arguments along with a bonus number seven argument at the end to show that while the Lord God is the first speaker in verse 16, that the final speaker in the final statement of verse 16 is none other than King Cyrus. Argument number one, the original language does not require the continuation of the divine speaker. In fact, a number of modern translations place in quotes after 
Isaiah 48, verse 16a, which is the middle of the verse. Let's take a look at some of those translations. Here on Bible Hub, we search for Isaiah 48, 16, and you'll see that it divides it into modern translations, classic translations, and literal translations. Among the classic translations that do have quotations, for example, the New King James Version, you'll see that the quotations are around the entire verse, thus indicating that the one who's speaking is the same speaker throughout. However, with the exception of the New American Standard Versions, what you'll find is that many modern translations actually put the end quotes after 16a, leaving 16b as a separate statement. You see this in the NIV, in the New International Version, the New Living Translation, the ESV, the English Standard Version, the BSB, the Berean Study Bible. In fact, even down in the Christian Standard Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and the Good News Translation, right? Mostly a paraphrase. They not only put the quotation in quotations after 16a, they even put 16b in parentheses. As a result of this, they're arguing that there's nothing in the Hebrew that necessitates there be a continuation of the speaker. In fact, what many of them see is that in the Hebrew, there's a conjunction there, the word atah, which is commonly used as a indication of a consequence of what has preceded. And it does not, in its uses, require that the same person be speaking. In fact, we see this used in Isaiah 30 verse 8 or 33 verse 10, or even in Isaiah 43 verse 1, which begins a new section in Isaiah, we have that word atah used, and it's now, therefore, so now, therefore now, and now, to say, hey, in light of what has preceded, here is a conclusion, and it does not have to be the same speaker. As a result, these translations actually indicate from their use of the quotations that 16b can be and should be viewed as a separate quotation. In fact, we see this actually made clear in the Net Bible in their study notes on verse 16, where they actually say the speaker here is not identified specifically, but he is probably Cyrus, the Lord's ally mentioned in verses 14 through 15. And we obviously agree with this footnote. Next argument. Immediate context is about the Lord speaking prophetically to Cyrus. When you look at verses 12 through 15, what many people often miss is that it's the Lord actually talking to King Cyrus, who does not yet exist. Remember, Isaiah is writing this 150 years before Cyrus arrives on the scene, and yet God is speaking directly to Cyrus, calling him by name, referring to him and what he will do on his behalf. Now, when we look at this context, we see that God is speaking very specifically to Cyrus. Let's examine the Net Bible for the entire context. In the Net Bible, if we begin at verse 12, and on down through verse 16, we'll see that the Lord God is speaking. However, what many people miss is that in verse 14, God specifically is talking to Cyrus. All of you gather together and listen. Who among them announced these? The Lord's ally, that's his friend, same word that's used and applied to Abraham as the friend of the Lord earlier in Isaiah, is now applied to Cyrus. The Lord's ally, and the Net Bible actually puts a note, friend or covenant partner, is a reference to Cyrus. And it continues, that ally will carry out his desire against Babylon. Notice the historical context. This is someone who will be a military leader and strategist against Babylon. He will exert his power against the Babylonians. Now the Lord goes on to say, I, I have spoken. Yes, I have summoned him. Well, well who is that? that? That's Cyrus. I will lead him and he will succeed. Now, we see that in history, but we see it first proclaimed prophetically in Isaiah. And notice what he says to him. He says this, approach me, listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. When it happens, I am there. Now, God is saying, I'll be the one who's going to carry this out. I'm going to be the one who actually brings this to pass. And then, as we noted, the Net Bible ends the quotes 
and puts the response. So now the sovereign Lord has sent me accompanied by his spirit. And they put the note that they believe that this is very likely Cyrus, who is the one who has been spoken about in verses 14 down to 15. In other words, even the context is about the Lord speaking to Cyrus. And they believe that this is the prophetic response of Cyrus to the Lord. Hopefully now you can already see why this case is compelling, but it's about to get even better. Argument number three. In this entire section of Isaiah, and we're here focusing upon about four and a half chapters, the Lord is repeatedly speaking prophetically to Cyrus about the end of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. Now, this section begins in chapter 44, verse 24, and extends all the way to chapter 48, verse 22. In other words, this is known as the Cyrus section covering multiple chapters of Isaiah. Let's look at these in detail. Once you see this, you will be greatly impressed. Now, this is impressive. In chapter 41 of Isaiah, God makes two enigmatic statements about Cyrus that we later know are about him. However, beginning in chapter 44, he actually begins to give some of the clearest prophecies about Cyrus. The first begins at the end of chapter 44, and hence I call it a half chapter. But this is generally regarded as God's first announcement to Cyrus. He calls Cyrus his shepherd, and he shall fulfill all God's purpose. Additionally, in chapter 45, at the beginning of that chapter, God calls Cyrus his anointed. And he says that he will grasp Cyrus's right hand in order that Cyrus can subdue nations. And he says explicitly, I equip you, though you do not know me. And he talks about how he stirred him up in justice and how he shall build God's city and set God's exiles free. In chapter 46, the Lord declares the end from the beginning. He says, my counsel will stand and Cyrus will accomplish all God's purpose. And he says that Cyrus is a bird of prey from the east. And he calls him the man of his own counsel from a far country. Notice Cyrus is here a man of God's own counsel. Chapter 47 is interesting because it's actually not about Cyrus. Nevertheless, it's about the humiliation of Babylon, how God will bring Babylon to a ruin. And he says he's going to do it by conquest. Now, we know from the preceding chapters and the succeeding chapter that it's about Cyrus who's going to bring this about. So even 47, which is about the humiliation of Babylon in this section, is about Cyrus's conquest of Babylon. Finally, in chapter 48, beginning at verse 12 to 22, God makes direct promises to Cyrus and it includes our verse, verse 16, the Lord sent me and his spirit. And he talks about after this, how the exiles will return. And we know that that's done at the hand of Cyrus under God's rule. This is amazing because that means beginning in chapter 44 at the end, all the way to chapter 48 at its end, this may be rightly considered the Lord's section about Cyrus. Now, God touches on other points, but this is the theme. Now, what's even more important is after chapter 48, you do not have any further mention in Isaiah either about Cyrus or specifically about Babylon. Now, that's amazing because I'd always thought that, you know, Babylon's all throughout the, the, the book of Isaiah. But actually, once God sets the people free or proclaims that he will set the people free in Isaiah 48, verse 21 and 22, you don't have any further mention of Babylon or Cyrus. So this is properly called the Cyrus section and focuses on the return of the Jewish exiles from Babylon. It gets even more impressive. One of the things that God does is he has a pattern of speaking throughout this section. In chapter 44, God gives his unique identification. I am the Lord. Then he gives us an example of his unique work of creation. I made the heavens and the earth. And then we have God giving a unique word of revelation. And in chapter 44, it's Cyrus will rebuild Jerusalem. And God often says in all of these cases that it's for Israel. I mean, he's doing this for his people. Now, it 
they show up in different locations in this chapter. But we find in all of the remaining chapters in this section is that that pattern is repeated. Now, God does it in different orders, but the same can be said true for Isaiah 45. We see God's unique identification. I am the Lord. God's unique work of creation. I made the heavens and the earth. God's unique words of revelation about Cyrus. He calls Cyrus by name. And of course, he does it all for Israel. The same can be said for chapter 46. And even in chapter 47, even though we don't have that full pattern, we still see the Lord in humbling Babylon begins by giving his unique identification. I am the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. But in chapter 48, we see the same pattern. God's unique identification in verses 1 to 2, his unique work of creation in verses 12 to 13, and his unique words of revelation about Cyrus first in verses 3 to 11, but also in 14 through 16, all for the purpose of Israel, verses 17 to 22, which ends the chapter. In other words, not only is this a Cyrus section, but we see the pattern of how God speaks throughout this entire section. Argument number four. In the Lord God's first announcement to Cyrus, he foretells two of Cyrus's declaration. Let's examine Isaiah 44, verse 28. As I pointed out, we have God making these statements to Cyrus. Now, many of you may say, okay, but you're claiming in chapter 48, verse 16, that Cyrus is responding in the text before he exists to the Lord. Now that seems like a bit of a stretch. I mean, we don't have examples of that, do we? And the answer is, yes, we do. In this very section, we have the Lord God speaking to Cyrus, calling him, and then the, the Lord God saying, this is what Cyrus is going to say before Cyrus even says it. Let's examine chapter 44, verse 28 in the first announcement. God actually quotes Cyrus. He says, he will say to Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be rebuilt. Now, that's a quotation from Cyrus. In fact, you'll see it in a number of translations in quotes. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. In other words, God is not only prophetically calling Cyrus, he's prophetically putting words in Cyrus's mouth. He's stirring up Cyrus's spirit and speaking his words through Cyrus. Now we see this confirmed in the book of Ezra. We see this confirmed in the book of First Chronicles, and we see it elsewhere. But the most important part to note here is that God is the one who is doing this work. Now, this is absolutely amazing. Now, many people just kind of study the Bible and say, oh, it's just a religious text. But one of the most profound things about the scriptures is that God has statements like this. Isaiah was written 150 years before Cyrus arrived. And what's amazing is he repeatedly points back to this and says, hey, I'm the one who created the heavens and the earth. As if to say, do not be surprised that I can tell you the beginning from the end and that my counsel will stand. And then he says these prophetic words, so much so that this is recorded in the Hebrew scriptures before Cyrus arrives. And it is proof of the supernatural nature of scripture. Now, this is not the only place that we have statements like this. We have it elsewhere. And this is why if you're watching this and you're a non-Christian, you have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should really take sit up and take notice. I know a number of people read and watch our videos and our material. And you may just read it and just say, I'm interested in this discussion about the Trinity. But I want to use this to show you the Bible's unique supernatural nature. This is written 150 years before Cyrus even arrived. And that's why this is profound. And that's why this is true prophecy. Let's continue. Argument number five, Cyrus is God's spirit anointed ruler. Very often when we press our case that this is Cyrus in verse 16 of chapter 48, many people point out, well, in that chapter, it ends by saying, and now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Now, that sounds like the spirit is someone who's accompanying the person who is being sent. Now, they say that sounds like another person, to which we say, not really. When you look at all of the scriptures, including Isaiah, you see a very clear pattern. First of all, you see that God himself is spirit. This is shown in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1 to 3. And we have Jesus saying it conclusively in John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit. 
But more importantly, we see that when God sends Cyrus, he promises to be with him, to equip him, to hold his hand. Now, not surprisingly, we see that God, who is spirit, does this by putting his spirit upon his chosen instruments. In fact, in Isaiah 59, verse 21, we see an example where God is talking about people, Israelites, whom he puts his spirit upon, and then they speak his words. They carry out his works. He's with them. In other words, it doesn't require a third person to have God put his spirit upon you. We see this also in Isaiah of the true Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 5, chapter 61, verse 1 to 4, and chapter 42, verse 1 through 4, we have God promising that the Messiah will be anointed. Now, that word Messiah means one who has been anointed. But anointed how? God puts his spirit upon his chosen servant. We see this explicitly in Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, where God says, I will put my spirit upon my chosen, my servant, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Now that's about the true Messiah who is from the line of David. But in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Peter can confirm this by saying, you know how beginning at John's baptism, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good because God was with him. And that's the promise. That's all that's required, that God who is spirit has put his spirit upon his servant. Now, we have many videos on this channel that address that topic, but that's all that's required for God's spirit to be with Cyrus is God to put his spirit upon Cyrus or that God by his spirit stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. So when we see this Trinity claim that and now the Lord God has sent me in his spirit, we can answer that that does not require not only a second divine person it doesn't require a third divine person argument number six this is a major argument that many people don't consider what trinitarians are essentially claiming is that this verse is a revelation in the old testament of the trinity and that someone after the time of christ particularly the apostles and the early church when they read this they would have read this and said this is the trinity this is all three members here's a major flaw in this argument there are no New Testament writers where they apply this verse, 4816b or even 4816a, to the Lord Jesus as a messianic passage. And here, as proof, I'm going to give all 27 books of the New Testament. There's not a single place. Now, you would think that because the New Testament is so set on proving the Messiahship of Christ, where they quote passages like Isaiah 53, they quote passages like Psalm 16 and elsewhere and Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 and other passages in Isaiah proving that Christ is the Messiah, that here, that this passage proves the Trinity, that they would quote it, but there are none. Which means if you're making this argument, you're on your own. You have no New Testament proof. Now, that's major. When I was a Trinitarian, I, I knew this, and this bothered me because I said, man, if we only had either Peter or Paul or John say, well, we know that God, his son, and the spirit are now working within us because, and then they said they cite Isaiah 48. Verse 16, you know, B, and he said, the Lord Jesus himself said this, right? After the right of Hebrews has said something like that, that would be all the conclusive proof you would need for the doctrine of the Trinity from this text. But no one does that. And so you, if you're using it as proof, you need to be warned. You're on your own. You're saying something that God never concludes. You're, you're inferring and implying and requiring something that's not required. Let's take a moment here and summarize our arguments. First, in argument one, we show that the original language, the Hebrew, does not require the continuation of the divine speaker. In fact, you see modern translations agreeing with our contention that the conjunction used there, ta in Hebrew, actually is a consequential conjunction and it allows for a new speaker, at the very least for an end of that quotation from 16a. Argument number two. The immediate context is about the Lord speaking prophetically to Cyrus. Beginning at verse 12 and following, the Lord is talking about Cyrus, and many people, if not all, agree. Thirdly, this entire section, we're talking four and a half chapters, 
are all about the Lord speaking prophetically to Cyrus and about the end of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. And we showed this very clearly in all of these chapters. Fifthly, we show that Cyrus is indeed God's spirit anointed ruler. He's called the anointed, the Lord's anointed in chapter 45, verse 1. And we pointed out how all that's required is that God put his spirit upon him, which would mean that when Cyrus shows, in fact, that verse in chapter 16b, it just simply says, and now the Lord has sent me. And it just says his spirit. That's it. That's all it says. So he's with the spirit, in the spirit, and he's being sent. Or the spirit is upon him and he's being sent. And we see this being said of other people in the book of Isaiah, especially of the Messiah, but not only of the Messiah. And then lastly, and majorly, no New Testament writers takes Isaiah 48, 16b and applies it to the Lord Jesus as a messianic passage. Now, these six arguments would be sufficient to make our case. However, as I've said to you, I have a seventh argument. This is a bonus argument, and I want you to really consider this. Why is this passage being used so strongly? Well, the reason is they believe that it's Old Testament proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. However, here's the big problem. There's no case where any New Testament writer ever applies an Old Testament passage as a fulfillment of the Trinity. And here I'm going to quote the entire Bible, meaning if you go through all 66 books, there is no one who takes any passage either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and says this passage is proof that God is three persons or there are three within God or he's three in one. No, there's no passage like that. Not only is Isaiah 48, 16 not used as a proof text for the Trinity in the New Testament, no passages, none. They never pause. Matthew or the writer of Hebrews, they never pause and say, by the way, this Old Testament text was concealing the reality that's now been revealed that God is three in one. Now, I want you to think about that. That means we talk about all types of doctrines where they do this resurrection, the crucifixion of Christ, his enthronement, his return. We even talk about his worship. It's covered in the Old Testament. But somehow the New Testament writers, it, it just they forget to do it is to get a single Old Testament passage and say that it's about the Trinity. Now, Trinitarians have suggested many passages. Uh, most of them will say, hey, if you ask them, is there is the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament, they'll, they'll find a few passages. They'll say, okay, here, here's some non-triune passages about God and his son or the angel of the Lord. Okay, well, we're, we're Bonitarian, so we believe that God and his son are talked about in the Old Testament. But some will even cite Genesis 1, 1 through 2, which we don't believe is explicitly Trinitarian, or Genesis chapter 18 to 19, but, but these are all problematic. They don't necessitate the Trinity and nothing in those texts or in the New Testament requires it. Finally, when you press them on proof from the Old Testament of the Trinity, usually everyone goes to Isaiah 48, 16 as the best text. And if this is the best text and it's not there, then what does that say about the doctrine of the Trinity? Not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. So when we point out that Trinitarians are claiming that one member of the Trinity is speaking to three members. Our argument is, show us that anywhere where you have all three in a conversation are being described and the Bible actually saying this is the revelation of that truth. You have to infer that. You have to imply that. Much is being done in Isaiah 48, verse 16. So what's our conclusion on this? Our conclusion here is very simple is that the Bible is very simple in this passage. This is what we as Bonitarians are claiming. In the first part of verse 16, the Lord is calling Cyrus. Now, this is consistent with that context and the wider section of Isaiah. It says, approach me, listen to this. From the very first, I have not spoken in secret. When it happens, I am there. Now, that's Isaiah 48, 16a from the Net Bible. But the next statement, where it has the conjunction, is Cyrus responding to the Lord's call. So now the sovereign Lord has sent me. That's why he says he's actually talking about the sovereign Lord. The sovereign Lord has sent me accompanied by his spirit. Now, who's the one who has been accompanied by the spirit of God, who is sent by God in this context and in this section is none other than King Cyrus. So to answer this question, is Isaiah 48, 16 about the Trinity or King Cyrus? As a Bonitarian, we answer, 
There are no passages that are about the Trinity, including this one that's about King Cyrus. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for always praying for us and supporting us. And as always, we say grace and peace times two. Thanks for watching.